questions. It's therefore time for members' statements. If we move to member statements, it's because we need to wait for the member, and we are now in members' statements. The member from Whitby, Oshawa. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. And the United Way of Durham Region has been changing its fundraising practices to respond to local deindustrialization. In the past, the United Way Speaker was able to collect substantial donations from manufacturers and other suppliers when it held fundraising events and large-scale fundraising campaigns. Unfortunately, Speaker, the manufacturing sector has declined over time in Durham Region and fewer employees work in the industry. As a result, the United Way has had to adapt and look for alternative means to fundraise in the region. And organizers are encouraging employees who make donations through their employer to make their donations where they live. And this makes sense, Speaker, as roughly 52% of workers in the region of Durham commute across the Greater Toronto Area each day. Under this direction, Speaker, the United Way of Durham Region has set a goal to raise $2.9 million in 2017, an increase from $2.68 million that they raised last year during their annual campaign. Speaker, these funds helped the 30 agencies and roughly 175 programs offered locally. Speaker, I know the residents from Durham will want to support the area in which they live, and donating to the United Way of Durham Region will give them the opportunity to make a difference in the lives of many others in this community. Thank you, Speaker. Further member statements, the member from London Fanshawe. It is always a privilege to rise in the Legislature as the MPP for London Fanshawe on behalf of my constituents. I bring the voices of families and caregivers to the Legislature to share their experiences in long-term care with all members of the House. Janice Duffy contacted me about her father, Douglas. Her father has been a resident in long-term care for three years. He has experienced several instances of mental and physical abuse, neglect, and inconsistent care. Janice, like many other families, are stressed because they are worrying about their loved one's care. Janice visits her father. He shows her advertisements for apartment rent, apartments to rent. When she asks him why he clips these ads, his answer is heartbreaking. He asks why he has to live in a long-term care home when he doesn't receive the basic care he needs. When did things start breaking down in long-term care? Well, we only have to look back to the Conservative Harris government and their private for-profit health care agenda, which resulted in thousands of layoffs of frontline health care workers. Things are only getting worse under the Liberal Win government. Families and frontline workers are telling us that there is one PSW to 30 residents, and frontline workers are run off their feet. There's just not enough time to for staff to deliver basic care. Why does this government stubbornly refuse to acknowledge the systemic issues in our long-term care system, including safety of residents and staff, funding levels, quality of care and staffing levels? When will this government stop ignoring the motion that was passed in the legislature to expand the public inquiry and commit to examining the systemic problems in long-term care beyond the wet law for investigation? Thank you. Member Stevens, the member from Mississauga, Brampton South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend, I was delighted to attend the Afro Global Excellence Awards hosted by Afro Global Television. The awards is an initiative of Afro Global Television and esteemed Planet Africa organization, which includes television show now broadcasted in Canada, Europe, and Africa. Their vision is to motivate people of African origin despite where they were born or raised, and to celebrate their leadership and excellence. Recipients of the 2017 Excellence Awards are Honorable Tony Inns, Paulette Senior, Charles Marful, Andrea A. Davis, Dr. Lisa Egboga, and Dr. Stan Chu Elo, Leonie Tachat, Councillor Michael Thompson, Dr. Mansfield Edwards, Atty Rutherford, Dr. Churchill Abiodun, Namugni Q1 Nuka, Jackie Apia, Franklin Omorona, Dwayne Dixon, Emmanuel Kabongo. Mr. Speaker, I would like to congratulate all the recipients of the Afro Global Excellence Awards. Kudos to all of them. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I'm just rising today while there's an autism rally going on outside, so I want to highlight a little bit about why the Ontario, Co uh, Ontario Autism Coalition is here once again advocating on behalf of families with children with autism. Uh, they did a very comprehensive survey, so they wanted to highlight some of the issues. I'm just going to read a couple of things from the survey. 72 percent of parents who were surveyed felt that their child with autism does not receive support at the level that they need at school. 97 per cent said that their child had an individual education program in place last year, but they were not given meaningful input into that program. Uh, only 45 per cent said that there was a safety plan in place for their child, and, just, um, and only 29 per cent said that they got, were able to give meaningful input. So I just want to mention um, that uh, one of the highlights of the rally is the discussion that autism doesn't end at school, that there's too much violence in the classrooms in our schools, that we need ABA to be available as part of the school program within our schools. Um, service dogs have to be accommodated. Kenner spoke very passionately about his dog. Uh, there was an article last week about a boy who was denied his iPad until the mother went to the media. Um, and uh, I think that we can do better. We can uh, work all together to create a better comprehensive plan uh, for autism and special needs children in our school. Thank schools. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further members, same as the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today I rise to talk about what's going on with the college faculty at the campus across Ontario. I have seen the impact of the strike at Niagara College has had on workers and families in my riding. I have spoken to Niagara College President Dan Patterson about this issue and encourages all parties to get back to the bargaining table to work towards a fair contract for college staff. Mr. Speaker, the ratio of part-time contract staff to full-time staff at the college is roughly 8 to 2. That's 80 percent part-time staff, which is unacceptable. These part-time instructors are paid less than their co-workers and go from one short contract to the next. This strike is not just about the college. The striking fa faculty are standing up for young people in Ontario to make sure when they graduate, they can count on having a full-time, stable job. Students are paying ever-increasing tuition fees and are concerned about their future of their semester and getting full-time employment. In this situation, a fair response from Ontario colleges could possibly, uh, possibly affect students' futures. Mr. Speaker, funding cuts from both Liberal and Conservative governments have forced colleges to, to use drastic cut, cutting measures. Unfortunately, they have targeted instructors. It's not fair to instructors and it's not fair to students who depend on a good education for a good life, including full-time, stable employment. We need both parties to get back to the bargaining table and work to ensure instructors have a fair deal for the benefits of faculty, students, and colleges. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Member Statement, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Speaker. Human trafficking is a deplorable crime as well as a human rights violation that robs the safety, livelihood, and dignity of those who are exploited and abused. Because survivors are controlled mentally, physically, and emotionally by traffickers, it is difficult for them to leave and find help. Those who do find a way out often need support in a range of areas, such as trauma counselling, addictions recovery, job training, and more. Our government has already had great success with our strategy to end human trafficking, but there is always more work to be done. That is why yesterday I was proud to announce that the FCJ Refugee Centre in my riding of Davenport Migrant Worker Centre will be receiving over $369,000 in funding to identify, intervene in, and prevent labour trafficking and exploitation situations among migrant workers in Davenport and across the province. FCJ is an amazing organization that does truly remarkable work to help refugees and newcomers, and this additional funding is going to go a long way to fight human trafficking in Davenport and in Ontario. And I want to thank Francisco and Lolly Rico, the directors at the centre, as well as Varka Kayla Dizahevia, who is the Anti-Human Trafficking Project Coordinator for the work that they do. Human trafficking is an atrocious reality for too many people, and the agencies across Ontario working tirelessly to put an end to this practice are nothing short of heroes. Thank you for the work that you do. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last week, the President and CEO, CEO of the Trillium Gift of Life Network 
Ronnie Gaffsey made a very important announcement. According to Trillium's records over the last quarter, the Sioux Area Hospital was one of 19 hospitals across Ontario to achieve a 100% conversion rate of potential donors that eventually go on to donate. One of 19, Mr. Speaker, out of a total of 150 hospitals, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, out of 150 hospitals in this province. To say that I am proud of my community and the dedicated workers at the Sioux Area Hospital would be an understatement. But the good, good news does not stop there. Not only does the Sioux Area Hospital boast one of the highest rates for notifying Trillium of potential donors, but over 30 members of our community of Sault Ste. Marie, over 30,000 members of our community of Sault Ste. Marie, that's about just over 70,000 population, have registered to be an organ donor. That's just over 45% of our entire population, and that number is expected to climb over time. So in closing, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank Ms. Gassi and her team at the Trillium Gift of Life Network and the dedicated and hardworking staff at the Sioux Area Hospital, but most importantly, I want to thank my community of Sault Ste. Marie. Without you, none of this would have ever been possible, and I'm proud to represent each and, one of, each and every one of you as your MPP. And just as a final point, I just want to note as well that uh, while our community sits at 45 percent, we're only 10 percent below being number one in the entire province. So I want to say thank you for that. Thank you. Further members' statements? The member from Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I want to uh, talk about an incredible new alliance that's being uh, created uh, out of Sunnybrook Hospital, one of North America's premier hospitals, especially when it comes to children's health and uh, maternal health. And this new alliance is called the Alliance for the Prevention of Preterm Births and Stillbirths. The alliance is a collaboration of families, hospitals, maternal child networks, and maternal newborn care providers that aims to create a profoundly important shift in thinking and resolving some of the challenges that women are having with preterm births and stillbirths. Uh, with recent scientific discoveries, it is very evident that premature births are preventable, and in some cases it requires simple screening or even the taking of a baby aspirin. The uh, alliance is led by the incredible world-renowned uh, obstetrician uh, and chair of the maternal fetal medicine research uh, program at Sunnybrook. It's Dr. John Barrett, ably assisted by uh, midwife Wendy Catherine. So this alliance uh, will partner with the uh, Sunnybrook's Canadian Premature Babies Foundation uh, and also with PAIL, the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Awareness Network. So this will be a major breakthrough in uh, helping uh, curb the uh, rate of uh, prenatal deaths and stillbirths. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements? The member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Yes, uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the many employees of Toronto's Park Hyatt Hotel, whose hospitality and hard work have always made me and so many others through the years feel at home, away from home. I'll start with a thank you uh, for all 385 members of their dedicated staff who worked tirelessly, some for well over 30 years, like Joe, the rooftop, rooftop bartender, now retired, was there for 57 years. At the corner of Bloor and Avenue Road, Park Plaza Hotel is one of the most esteemed hotels in the city. Breaking ground in 1928, the Park Plaza began housing guests in 1936 for as little as $3 a night. It's gone up slightly since then, Speaker. The hotel became a magnet for Canadian writers, including Margaret Atwood, Mordecai Reichler, and also served as a breeding ground for political strategy as the unofficial headquarters for Premier Bill Davis's Big Blue Machine meetings. In 1999, the Hyatt chain purchased the structure and have announced closure this November ahead of an extensive renovation and grand reopening for the fall of 2019. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity especially to thank all staff for their dedicated service from the valets, the bellmen like Charles, all of the lovely Anona staff, of course, the Le Claydor, Concierge, Orshan and Stephen, Max and Sarah, to the front house desk staff, Michael, Casey, Amy, Julie, Mark and Tony, and of course, general manager, Bonnie and her team, including Alicia and Christine. Thank you for all your work and dedication. I very much appreciate it and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.
I thank all members for their statements. I have a point of order from the member from Kitchener Centre. Uh, speaker, I'd like to correct my record from a member's statement from yesterday. I mentioned in a member's statement that the federal government has allocated $12 million in humanitarian aid to the Rohingya refugees, and that is in addition to money they've already been there put in this year. It's a total of $25 million for 2017. Thank you. Thank you. Every member is entitled to correct their own record. Therefore, it's time for reports by committees. The member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Speaker. I ask.